Hello everyone and welcome to the podcast of English composer Andrew Downs. My name is Paula Downs, I am Andrew's younger daughter and on today's show I'm going to be doing something a little bit different. I'm going to be narrating an amazing climate change book for children. The Tantrum That Saved the World by Megan Herbert and Michael E. Mann. This will be accompanied by music by Andrew Downs, performed by Rupert Marshall Luck on the violin. Bing bong! Sophia was minding her business one day, when quite without warning, a bear came to stay. The ice that he lived on had ceased to exist. He hoped that Sophia would kindly assist. Startled and flustered, Sophia said, No! But the bear came right in. He had nowhere to go. More out of towners arrived needing aid, asking if it was all right that they stayed. Somehow the seas have flooded our land. The kids ran right in. They were quite out of hand. (laughs) Sophia attempted to turn them away. We've got nowhere else, was all they could say. Unwelcome arrivals showed up all day long. Bing bong! Bing bong! Bing bong! A sad swarm of bees had not one idea if spring had just come or fall was quite near. A pale pink flamingo who was hungry and weak bugged a sea turtle whose outlook was bleak. Both were upset that the sights of their nests were being disrupted by unwanted guests. Farmers whose farmland was withered and dry griped with the seamen who couldn't get by. Where had the fish gone? Where was the rain? They wanted to work more, not sit and complain. A large Bengal tiger just chuffed with dismay. Everyone wisely stayed out of his way. They all turned to face her with hope in their eyes, expecting Sophia to halt their demise. I'm just a kid, what can I do? Someone must help us, it's now up to you. (laughs) Sophia by this time felt nothing but stress. Her day was disrupted, her house was a mess. She had no idea how she ought to begin to help them all out of the bind they were in. Unable to put up a front anymore, she went to her bedroom and slammed shut the door. (laughs) Hiding and fretting, she couldn't think why these folks were resolved to grey up her blue sky. She wanted to scream and to act uncontrolled, but tantrums were pointless, that's what she'd been told. Still, it wasn't Sophia's fault they were in strife. She'd tell them politely to get out of her life. But what she saw next brought Sophia up short. They weren't here to spite her. They needed support. All of a sudden, the girl understood. Goodwill costs nothing and does nothing but good. Now that 
once she'd realised compassion was key, Sophia would call on the powers that be. Let's go, said Sophia. Next stop, City Hall. The grown-ups would sort this mess once and for all. I need an appointment regarding this fauna who've noticed our planet's becoming a sauna. So bring us the top dog, the biggest big cheese to solve all our problems and put us at ease. They said, take a number and wait, if you please. Sophia attempted to move things along. The fact we've been waiting so long is quite wrong. This tiger's hungrier by the minute. This pink flamingo's reached her limit. This polar bear is far too warm. These bees can hardly form a swarm. Someone must help them. Why not you? We see you're upset, but we've got things to do. Sophia felt beaten, forsaken and flawed. She hadn't predicted that she'd be ignored. Again she felt feelings of rage amplify, but she squashed them back down and started to cry. That's when her friends rallied round to support her, explaining their stories to make the wait shorter. Suddenly she saw how each tale was connected, that everyone loses when one part's neglected. How would she feel if her land were depleted, her food disappeared, her home overheated? And what was to say that she wouldn't be next? She'd already noticed weird weather effects. How could they ask her to sit there and wait? If they dilly-dallied, would it be too late? Sophia thought deeply and then made her choice. She had to give those who'd been silenced a voice. Sophia stepped forward, ignoring the line. She spoke with conviction and brandished her sign. When someone else suffers, the whole world's affected. The earth is our home, we have to protect it. Despite her sound logic, she still was deflected. Your sentiment's sweet, kid, but what you don't get is fixing these problems will put us in debt. We've done all we can, they said with condescension. This issue is far beyond your comprehension. If you've got something you still need to say, send in a form and we'll file it away. (laughs) 
Pushed to the limit, Sophia saw red. She felt disregarded and scorned and misled. She did understand what this was about. It was her future they planned to sell out. Sophia's strong feelings smouldered once more and this time they'd gotten too big to ignore. Raging with purpose, her banners unfurled, she kicked off a tantrum to save the whole world. It tumbled down streets into towns of all lands. It echoed in forests on glaciers and sands. People and creatures alike felt its force. They ditched their distractions and looked for the source. And there was Sophia, a miniature for all, telling the multitudes how they could do more. Cooperative action could turn this high tide. They had strength in numbers and right on their side. They all told more people who told more folks still. They won hearts with kindness and minds with goodwill. And so on and so on until everyone was doing the hard work that had to be done. (music) Sophia's new friends soon waved her goodbye. They had second chances and new homes to try. They asked her to visit for a weekend or two. But Sophia was busy. She had things to do. What are global warming and climate change? For several hundred years, human beings used fossil fuels like oil, gasoline and coal to generate energy. For a long time, people only looked at the benefits of using these limited resources that came from the earth as they warmed homes, provided affordable transport and powered industry. But over the past half century, scientists began to notice the negative effects on relying on these energy sources. The waste product of the burning of fossil fuels, carbon dioxide, was building up in the Earth's atmosphere, creating negative impacts on the health of the planet. Carbon dioxide is what is known as a greenhouse gas. It can absorb heat that is escaping from Earth's surface. As these greenhouse gases build up in the atmosphere, they act like a blanket, causing the lower part of Earth's atmosphere and surface to warm up. This process is called global warming. That warming leads to many other effects, including the melting of ice, sea level rise, the shifting of rainfall patterns, and more extreme weather events. The changes that are happening in our natural world as a result of this warming are known as climate change. And these changes are having a negative impact on the inhabitants of Earth, the plants, animals and human beings, 
causing some of them to lose their homes or their ways of life. We sometimes refer to those forced to leave their homes because of climate change as climate refugees. Living things, including human beings, can adapt to changes in their environment that happen slowly. Climate change, however, is causing faster changes that are more difficult to deal with. The good news is that we are now aware of the changes and what we need to do to halt them, and hopefully even reverse them. And as a result, more and more people are using renewable energy sources that do not generate greenhouse gases. The following pages explain the stories of the climate refugees Sophia meets, how climate change is affecting them and their ecosystems, and what can be done to help them. Terms written in italics are further explained in the glossary. The polar bear. As Earth continues to warm, polar regions like the Arctic are warming up even faster than the rest of the planet. Since much of our planet's ice is in those regions, this warming is causing lots of the ice to melt. When the ice is on the land in the form of glaciers or ice sheets, the melt water flows into the ocean and causes what we refer to as sea level rise. In the Arctic, which is mostly ocean, the ice instead mainly exists as a thin layer floating on the sea, called sea ice. Polar bears rely on the sea ice for hunting seals the only food source that can provide them with the fat-rich diet they need. The polar bears float on the ice and hunt for the seals that pass below. Unfortunately, sea ice is rapidly disappearing. As the ice melts, the oceans absorb more sunlight, causing them to warm even faster, melting even more ice. It's a vicious cycle that is speeding up the melting of Arctic sea ice, meaning a shorter hunting season and diminished hunting grounds for the polar bear. The polar bear is an apex predator, which means that it sits at the top of the food chain. It is threatened by anything that disturbs not just the seals it feeds on, but animals further down the food chain, such as the crustaceans like shrimp that the seals eat. Crustaceans and other shell-forming marine invertebrates are threatened by the increasing acidity of ocean water which causes their shells to dissolve. This problem is known as ocean acidification and like climate change, it is caused by the buildup of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from the burning of fossil fuels. With the polar bear's survival at risk as a result of climate change, it was declared a threatened species by the United States in 2008 under the Endangered Species Act. The good news though, is that polar bears have the ability to adapt to modest shifts in climate. We can still save the polar bear if we reduce our use of fossil fuels sufficiently.
The Ikiribati family. Communities living in low-lying island nations and coastal tropical regions are particularly vulnerable to the effects of climate change. Kiribati is a low-lying island nation in the central equatorial Pacific, made up of a group of coral atolls. As new corals grow, they secrete a calcium carbonate skeleton. A ring of limestone, known as a reef, is built up from the accumulating calcium carbonate skeletons of dead corals. Sea levels are rising faster than the protective coral limestone around the islands can accumulate. To make matters worse, ocean acidification dissolves the calcium carbonate produced by the corals, impairing their ability to grow. Adding further to the problem, the island's limestone coasts are easily eroded by waves. The limestone is also highly porous, allowing salt water to penetrate deep into the interior of the island, polluting the already limited freshwater supplies. It no longer takes a tsunami or a storm surge to flood the islands. A seasonal high tide known as a king tide will do. As the smaller islands become unlivable, the main island of Tarawa is becoming overcrowded. There is a shortage of safe drinking water and the increasingly salty soil makes it difficult to grow food to feed the people. The Ikiribati will likely be forced to leave the islands in the near future, meaning that a child born there today is likely to belong to the last generation to grow up there. While there are nearby places that they can be relocated to, like New Zealand, they will have to give up their home and leave behind much of their culture, ancestry and traditions. Kiribati is not the only island nation facing these issues. As the climate changes and sea levels rise, many more of these climate refugees around the world will have to flee their homes and find somewhere else to live. Wherever they end up, they will be competing with people already living there for food, water and land. To solve the problem, we must all join forces to stop activity that results in further CO2 emissions. We must find a way to live together on a planet with fewer resources and a growing, moving population. Bee populations are declining around the world. Scientists have identified a number of factors that are likely causing this, including habitat loss, the use of pesticides in farming, and climate change. 
To understand the impact that climate change is having on bees, we must appreciate the interconnectedness of living things and how climate change is disrupting the complex relationships between plants and animals. Bees are pollinators. They travel from flower to flower collecting nectar, a sweet and nutritious food source produced by flowers. In return, the flowers get the benefit of the bees transporting pollen. It sticks to the bees' behinds, from one flower to another. That's the process of pollination, a form of fertilisation. It is critical to the long-term survival of the species. This relationship between bees and plants is an example of what is known as symbiosis. The plants and bees depend on each other. Because of the symbiosis between bees and plants, their life cycles are synchronised. The bee larvae mature into adult bees when the flowers bloom and the nectar begins to flow. The problem with climate change is that it is altering the natural cycle of the seasons causing the spring warm-up to happen earlier and earlier. Not only are the bees and plants unable to adapt fast enough to keep up, but they are adapting to changes at different rates. The bees are more sensitive to the warmer spring air temperatures, but the flowering of the plants is more influenced by the springtime snowmelt. Climate change is causing these two events to occur at different times, putting the bees and flowers out of sync. This disruption to natural rhythms threatens not only bees, but also a large variety of plants, insects, birds, amphibians and reptiles, all of which rely upon predictable environmental cues. As climate change causes rapid and unpredictable changes in weather and seasonal patterns, these living things are all at risk. If we can slow down the warming enough, however, we will give these animals more time to adapt to the changes that are happening. The Andean Flamingo Andean flamingos live in lakes and wetlands in the high plains, or altiplano, of the tropical Andes of South America. They are endangered by a number of human-caused disturbances, including water pollution from mining, the poaching of their nests, and the diversion of water from wetlands for agriculture. Shifting climate patterns are also a threat, as the glaciers of the Andean mountains whose meltwater feeds these wetlands, disappear. In fact, worldwide, the entire family of flamingos is threatened by climate change. Water, like most substances, expands as it warms. Therefore, ocean warming is also contributing to global sea level rise. Rising sea levels means flooding for coastal regions, which impacts the flamingos that live in shallow, coastal wetland environments. Some wetland inhabitants, like mangrove swamps, may be able to move inland, but where roads, cities and coastal development block the way, these wetland habitats may disappear completely. For these coastal dwelling flamingos, loss of habitat is only one threat they face. Their food supply will also be impacted. 
The flamingo's characteristic pink hue comes from the brine shrimp that they feed on. Just like the crustaceans that feed the seals that provide food for polar bears, these tiny shrimp are threatened by ocean acidification. We see again the interconnectedness of living things and how harm to one species can affect other species within an ecosystem. The best way to save the Andean flamingo is to solve the problem at its root cause. We must stop burning fossil fuels for energy and prevent further build-up of carbon pollution in our atmosphere and oceans. Doing this will provide more time for the flamingo and indeed all animal and plant species to adapt to the changes that are underway. The Kemp's Ridley Sea Turtle The Kemp's Ridley Sea Turtle, and in fact all varieties of sea turtles, are threatened by some of the very same climate change impacts that threaten flamingos, including sea level rise and ocean acidification. Sea turtles, like nearly all other reptiles, must lay their eggs on land. The turtles choose certain beaches on which to build nests for their eggs. When the eggs hatch and the baby turtles emerge, they have only a short journey to the relative safety of the ocean. One of the amazing things about sea turtles is that their memories are imprinted with a map of the sandy beach where they are hatched. This allows them to return to the very same location decades later to mate and produce a new generation of baby turtles. But with sea level rise, those beaches may very well have disappeared by the time the turtles make it back to their original birthplace. Coral reefs are one of the key habitats for both the baby and adult sea turtles because of the abundance of food and the shelter from predators that these reefs provide. Sadly, coral reefs are also in decline because of ocean acidification. The acidic waters dissolve the skeletons of the corals, the structure that makes up the coral reefs. The warming of the ocean waters has led to more frequent so-called coral bleaching events, where coral reefs lose the symbiotic algae that give them their colour, becoming a sickly white instead. As these events become more frequent and sustained, coral reefs die off. Warming temperatures also affect sea turtles' breeding outcomes. Warmer waters result in more female than male hatchlings. That means that there aren't enough males to mate with the females, which leads to shrinking number of turtles with each generation. We can help the sea turtles by planting vegetation along beaches to provide better habitats for nesting. Ultimately though, the best way to help the turtles is to stop the accumulation of carbon pollution.
Syrian farmers. Agricultural regions around the world are already suffering from the effects of climate change. The people in the tropical regions of North Africa, including Egyptians, Algerians and the people of the Sudan Peninsula, sometimes experience long periods where daytime temperatures rise to 115 degrees Fahrenheit or 46 degrees Celsius, with nighttime temperatures never cooling below 86 degrees Fahrenheit or 30 degrees Celsius. Such conditions are simply too hot for human habitation. Meanwhile, the subtropical regions of the world are becoming too dry. California recently suffered its worst, most extended drought in at least 1,300 years. The drought devastated farms and led to water rationing in some areas. Syria is another subtropical region that has experienced severe drought in recent years that was almost certainly worsened by climate change. This drought, which has already lasted over 10 years, is the worst the region has seen in at least 900 years. In Syria, most farming is done by individual farmers and their families. The drought has ruined their farms and killed their livestock, forcing more than a million rural Syrians to flee into the cities. That means more people in cramped conditions competing for scarcer drinking water and food. This drives up prices in the cities, making it even more difficult for people to afford the space, food and water that they need. In this sort of environment, conflicts often arise. In Syria, a civil war triggered by these conditions has resulted in millions of climate refugees seeking safety elsewhere in the world. And with disadvantage and equality comes desperation, leading to behaviour that hurts others and disrupts social order. Every nation of the world feels the impacts. Once again, we see how interconnected our world really is. If harm comes to some of us, then harm can come to all of us. Working together is the key to solving these problems that will affect us all. New England fishermen. North Atlantic marine stocks are threatened due to warming waters, changing patterns of ocean currents, ocean acidification and shrinking fish populations. As a result, the livelihoods of the New England fishermen who rely on them are at risk too. New England waters are productive partly because of their cold temperature. Cold water can hold more oxygen and just as we need oxygen to breathe, Fish and other marine animals need oxygen taken in through their gills to survive. As waters warm, classic New England seafood species, swordfish, cod and lobster, have to move further north to cooler waters to survive. Limits on fish catches have seen swordfish populations increase. Populations of cod, however, are still shrinking, it seems due to warming waters. Lobsters also escaping warming waters are moving farther and farther north. Like all marine invertebrates, lobsters are being impacted by ocean acidification too. Climate change may also be altering ocean circulation patterns, making the waters of the North Atlantic less productive. Because all marine species are connected as part of an ecosystem, a disturbance to one part of the food chain can affect the entire community including the fishermen whose livelihoods depend on the health of seafood stocks. This impacts human beings as a species too. A billion of us, mostly from developing nations, rely on seafood as a primary source of protein. Sustainable practices are essential if we are going to be able to feed our growing population while also ensuring the survival of ocean species. It isn't just farming and fishing that are under threat from climate change. As the burning of fossil fuels causes climate change, 
bringing more extreme weather events, our infrastructure is at risk of being damaged, disrupting how we deliver food and other goods. Fortunately, sustainable, renewable energy solutions already exist. By convincing governments and businesses to adopt these solutions now, we can hopefully avoid the worst of the predicted impacts of climate change. The Bengal Tiger The survival of the Bengal Tiger is threatened by humans in several ways. Illegal hunting, called poaching, has brought their numbers down dramatically. So too has deforestation. Scientists fear that these factors alone could lead Bengal Tigers to extinction like their relatives elsewhere in Asia. Unfortunately, due to climate change, they face yet another human-created threat. The tiger's only natural habitat is a block of interlinked mangrove forests in Bangladesh and India that lie at the mouth of the great Ganges River. Known collectively as the Sundarbans, which means beautiful forest in Bengali, these forests are home to hundreds of species of fish, reptiles, mammals and birds, as well as the relatively small number of remaining wild Bengal tigers on earth. Mangrove trees lay their roots in the sandy bottom of the shallow tidal zone below the salty ocean water. The trees join together in an interconnected network to form a unique forested environment, found only in the world's tropical coastal regions. Like coral reefs, mangrove forests provide shelter and abundant food for marine life. They also help protect the coastal wetlands from tropical cyclones storm surges and damaging winds from hurricanes. This habitat, like so many natural environments, relies on stability to maintain its ecological balance. With just one foot of additional sea level rise, most of the Sundarbans would be submerged by the ocean, robbing the Bengal tiger of its home and reducing the population of breeding tigers to critical levels. There are things we can try to do to try to protect these amazing mammals. Local and national governments can adopt policies to conserve and expand mangrove swamps. They can enforce the laws that outlaw poaching. Slowing down global warming and sea level rise might also allow time for the mangrove forests to migrate slowly inland rather than be submerged. Once again, tackling climate change is critical if we are to save these creatures.
Many thanks for listening to this episode. I have put it together for an English Music Festival education project for children to be performed live in schools around the world alongside other commissions. Our offering comprises the book entitled The Tantrum That Saved the World by Megan Herbert and Michael E. Mann, which is available in hard copy and as an e-book, accompanied by Andrew Downs' Mass for Solo Violin, performed by Rupert Marshall Luck. You can purchase the sheet music and the recording of this work at andrewdowns.com. You can watch this podcast on YouTube along with the illustrations from the book The Tantrum That Saved the World.